Good morning, everybody. Oh, it's so good to see all of you. God bless you very much. Looking now at 2 Timothy chapter 4. I'm speaking through 2 Timothy. We're coming now close to the end. Close to the end of this powerful letter that Paul wrote to the churches that Timothy was pastoring, to Timothy especially as the pastor. Looking at verse number 6, it'll be on the screens for you as well. We'll be down to the end of verse number 13. 2 Timothy chapter number 4. Let's begin reading. This is Paul writing out to Timothy. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. That's the day of his coming. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Do your best to come to me quickly. For Demas, because he loved this world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Cratius has gone to Galatia and Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you because he has helped me, helped, he's been helpful to me in my ministry. I sent Tychicus to Ephesus. Here I am now in ministry for 50 years and I finally got Tychicus' name correctly. Took a long time, you know. Anyway, I said to Tychicus to Ephesus, When you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas and my scrolls, especially the parchments. Now, we're not going to be talking about uh, parchments and scrolls and, and, and cloaks today. We're not going to be talking about some of these men that Paul just passes by, touches on. But there are three men here in particular that we're going to look at today. We're going to look at uh, Demas. Look at Mark. We're also going to talk about Paul himself as he writes this great letter. And what you can see here is a great danger. There's a great danger for all those of us who are believers in Jesus Christ. And not just for believers, but for all people as they consider the things about life, what life's about, and whether the gospel is true or not. Here it is. Our greatest challenge is this present world. We have this man, Demas. And by the way, Demas is a nickname for Demetrius. And we can learn a lot by that, because that meant that, that, that Demas was Greek. His culture was Greek. And, and the Greeks were very much like what we are today in the 21st century. They love luxury. They love wealth. They love contentment. Physical beauty, does this sound similar to what we're going through? Physical beauty was, was very important to them. And so he was coming out of the Greek culture. Demas, though, was a man who spent time with Paul, was a faithful helper to him. He's mentioned in a number of Paul's letters. But now we read that Demas, in love with this present world, has gone. He's left Paul behind. Now, when you hear that, you, you, you might start thinking this is a, a prodigal son kind of story or a lost son kind of story. In the parable of the lost son, uh, the prodigal son, he... Um, takes his inheritance before it's time. Give me one third of what you have, Dad. It belongs to me anyway. And he goes out and he lives a wild life. And maybe you think that, that Demas, in love with the present world, he goes out and lives a wild life. But that's probably not what happens here. It's probably reading too much into the passage. All we know is he left because he was in love with the present world. All we can, can think is that maybe he left behind the life that he was living in service to God and to be an assistant to Paul and, and instead went back to his old life, a life about luxury, life about contentment, life about things and not God, a life where beauty and power and wealth was more important. You see, what was going on was this. Paul was in prison and Demas was helping him. And the way it worked out is you could go to prison you go right into the cell with the prisoner. You could take them food. You could care for their needs. And so Demas was going into the cell every day. And it, it, have you been to prison before? I've gone in prison ministry. And it doesn't smell very good. And, and the, the, Paul was eating bread with mold on it. it. had worms in it. And Demas was seeing this every day and smelling the smells and going through all this. And one day he just says to himself, you know, you can just forget this. The life I used to be living was a lot happier than this. I had a lot more back in that life. And he leaves. So he goes back to the life he was, that he was used to living. 
He was facing this great challenge, the challenge that all of us face who follow Jesus, that the life we used to live might be more attractive than the life we spend with God. Because the life we used to live, we could do the way we want to, have what we wanted to have. And we convince ourselves that we want to have everything all the people in the world have. We want the house. We want the car. We want the success. We want the popularity. We want the luxury. So we face this challenge of our love for the, this present world. And sometimes, as a believer, we go back to it. In the New Testament, we have presented to us two different kinds of worlds. We have the world that belongs to God. He is the Lord. He is the King. It's a world of, of spiritual happiness, of joy in the soul. It's a world where we have to make a decision. Now, are you listening? We make a decision to live different than people who don't know Jesus. We, we make a decision to live a different kind of life, have a different kind of lifestyle. And because we have decided to, to put our money under God's control, we can't always buy all the things we want, all the things we desire, because we're giving part of our money to God. And uh, this kind of life is really the only kind of life that's worth living. Because it provides something for us that nothing can touch or take away. And it's also the, the kind of world that's that's taught, that's a world that belongs to Satan, controlled by Satan. It's a life of, of, of flesh and joy in the flesh. It's a life controlled by Satan where we have our values placed somewhere else than on God. This life is unfortunately, sadly, very attractive to a lot of people because it makes you happy today because your appetites are fulfilled. Paul said... Listen, my friend Demas has left me because he was in love with that kind of world, the world that is controlled by Satan, the world which is opposed to God. Now, now listen, every believer across life, on many occasions, many occasions, and thousands of kinds of ways, has to make that decision if they're going to stay inside the world that belongs to God and not go back to the world controlled by Satan. We have to make a decision that we're not going to be in love with this present world. We're going to be in love with the eternal world that belongs to God. And I was, you know, I was thinking about uh, this, and I'm, some things I could share with you about how people are making that decision to, to love the present world more than loving the world of God and uh, I'm going to talk about one in particular. But I just want to mention in passing what's happened last year is because of COVID. This has been the biggest surprise to me in 50 years of ministry. I've been, I've been absolutely dumbfounded. It never occurred to me this would happen. That we would face a virus like COVID and we would lose one third of the church in America. And they would go away. And, not, and they don't show any sign of coming back. Did you know this was happening? It's not our church only. We have lost about a third of our people in the last five years, although we are coming back. Thanks for being excited. I'm so glad to see that. But all of those are coming back really as new growth. Young families are coming in with children, which is an absolutely wonderful thing. You know, 100 years ago we had uh, the Spanish flu. It was worse than COVID. Much worse. But people at that time turned to Jesus, not away from Jesus. And what happened these last few years is that people were going to church and they couldn't go for a while. And they lost the godly habit and then walked away. That makes me sad. It really makes me sad. But I don't want to talk about that. I'll talk about something else. It might not seem to be right in the the main path here, but on, on Friday this week, something great happened. I got a chance to go. My wife went. Uh, uh, Josh and Sarah were there. Uh, Josh and Sarah's uh, folks from Arkansas were able to come to Greenbrier Christian Academy for Grandparents Day. That was a blast. I had so much fun. I really did. And all the classes come on stage one by one. So three and four-year-olds came up. That was Annalise's class. 
my granddaughter Annalise. And then the five-year-olds came up. That was Abigail's class. And they all went through fifth grade. And they showed pictures of the grandparents on the screens, me, you know, and, uh, the, and the grandkids, you know, with the grandparents. So they, they sang all these wonderful songs they performed. And it just was so sweet. It was so wonderful. But there was a sadness in my heart there as I was experiencing it. And don't forget last Sunday, you know, we have uh, 200 kids right now involved in our preschool and children's ministry here on Sunday mornings. And last Sunday when we had the great service, do you remember at the very end, Kids Jam Choir came out on the stage. Now, Kids Jam is one of our smaller children's ministries. It meets on Wednesday night. There were 40 kids in this choir. Did you enjoy this? Are you alive out there? Yes, it was wonderful, wasn't it? So somebody wrote, Ernie's sermon was great, but the kids stole the show. <laughs> so, you know, I saw hundreds of kids this week at our church, at the Greenbrier Christian Academy, and I was thinking of the, the 33 years I've been here at Deep Creek, at, at D.C. Church, and all the kids that we've had in our church went to Greenbrier Christian Academy or Stonebridge, some other Christian school, all the kids that came through our children's ministry, now, this is a general statement. You can't talk about any particular child. But all those kids have come through, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them. And just like every church, just like every area in America, 90% of them graduate high school and never come back. Oh, it bothers me so much. And our children's ministry here is designed to win kids to Jesus and to help them have some tools of discipleship and to grow and stay with the church. And even though we do this, we still are losing 90% of our kids when they get to high school, when they graduate and go off into college. And it's the greatest sadness that I experience in my ministry to see these kids and then to lose them. And I run into them in my life. You know, I run them into the grocery store. I run them to them at the, at the shopping mall. I run them at the ball field. And they say, oh, Ernie, remember, I used to go to your church, you know. And sometimes I see these kids with their eyes are empty. What a failure. We have to help our children love the world that belongs to God and not to fall in love with this present world and come to a place where that world seems more attractive than the things that God gives and they just walk away because that world is filled full of broken marriages and broken children and addiction and sadness and death. It is so, so horrible. Moms and dads, listen, this is not, I'm not going to talk about this more than this right now, but uh, I'll talk about some more again in the future months. But the way to do this with your children is not to be strict with them, it's to love them. And as you love them, teach them about Jesus and about this world that belongs to God. And to live the same kind of life at home when you're with your children that you live when you come to church. No soft hypocrisy. And, and you bring your kids to church on Sunday so they have a chance to hear and learn. Church is so much more important than baseball and soccer. It will change children's lives. And dads especially, you know, women outnumber men in church three, two to three to one. Dad, you need to be in church, sit beside your kid on that chair so they can see in you what it means to be a godly man. Being a godly man is absolutely critical at the center of what the home is about. And you keep your kids off of social media, at least until they're 16 or maybe 45. I'm glad I've got some life out there. Because social media is a pit in which kids fall into that teaches them that the world that belongs to the world and Satan is much better than the world that belongs to God. We have a responsibility to teach our children to stay in love with this present world. No, to stay in love with the world that belongs to God. Now, here's a great thing. Whoever you are, you can be a Demas, and you can wander away because you love this present world. But the great thing is you can come back. And when you, can come, when you come back, you'll be fully restored and fully used by God. We don't know what happened to Demas, but we know what happened to Mark. It's a neat story, really. 
One of my favorite stories in all of Scripture. In, in the book of Acts, uh, Paul and Barnabas, and Paul's writing this letter, they're pastors of the church in Antioch. And the church in Antioch is led by the Holy Spirit to send Paul and Barnabas out as evangelists to start churches. This is how it all started. Don't you get any ideas? Send me out. <laughs> I'm staying, okay? But Paul and Barnabas sent them out. And Barnabas had his nephew, his Mark. Mark was his nephew. And he says, Paul, let's take, let's take Mark with us. And Paul said, okay. So they go out on the first missionary journey. And then we read in Acts chapter 13 that Mark, who may have been a teenager, said, same way as Demas, forget this. I'm going back. I don't want this kind of life. I want a different kind of life. A few years went by and get to Acts 15. And uh, Paul and Barnabas are going out on the second missionary journey. And Barnabas says, let's take Mark. And Paul said, over my dead body. And these two great men of God, yes, it happens sometimes that men of God have this kind of experience. They fought so bitterly that they broke up. And Barnabas went his way, and Paul went his way, and Mark was left behind. Now, we don't know what happened. We, there's, there's no story of, of redemption, reconciliation. All we know is this, that as Paul is writing his letters, Mark's name starts popping up with great affection. And then Mark is very useful and helpful to Paul. And now we have the last thing that Paul ever wrote. And he said, Timothy, when you come to me, you bring Mark. I, I can't help it. This is making me tingle. I can tell you're tingling right now, too. I can, I can feel it. You bring Mark with you because he's helpful to be in my ministry. This is absolutely wonderful. Timothy, you bring Mark with you. One time in the past, he walked away. One time in the past, he was in love with this present world, and he walked away just like Demas. But God, God brought him back. And he's been restored. And now he's very powerful and helps me a great deal. And after Paul's death, the story with Mark continued. He became an associate of Peter. And Peter related to him the events of Jesus' life. And Mark recorded them in the gospel that bears his name. Just think, when you hold a gospel mark on your hand and read it, you read a, 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 a work from a man who one time walked away from Jesus but it come back. Now, I talked about this a few weeks ago. You may have grown up in church. I'm, maybe some folks right now watching online. You may have grown up in church. You may have sung the songs. You may have been involved in the children's ministry or whatever church you were part of. You prayed the prayers. You heard the sermons. But somewhere along the way, you fell in love with this present world and you walked away. You can come back. And when you come back, you can be fully restored. And when you come back, you can be useful to God. When you come back, God can give you the life you lost back to you again. This is how God works. There was a man and a woman who went on a safari. I say, there's a man and a woman who went on a safari. And the woman said, let's take mom with us. So they took the, he took his mother-in-law. They go on safari. After the first day, they wake up, get out of the tent, and, and mom's missing. Mother-in-law is gone. So the wife says, we've got to go find her. And they're frantic, looking all over for her to come to her clearing. And there's, there's mom, and there's a full-grown African lion, big, flowing mane, roaring at her. And the, the wife says, honey, do something. And he says, the lion got himself into this. Let him get himself out. You say, what's that joke got to do with this? People say, listen, I got myself into a bad life. And you're thinking to yourself, in that bad life you're living, I got myself into this mess, I got to get myself out. No, you don't. No, you don't. That's why Jesus came. He came to die for people like you, to redeem your life and pull you out of where you are and give you a whole new life. This is, this is why the church exists. This church is filled full of Demases and Marks. This church is filled full of people who have wandered away and God has brought back. 
And if you come back to God, you'll find a bunch of people who understand you, who love you, who will make sure you're forgiven and make sure you come into the family of God and are used by God again. That's what God does. That's what God's church does. All of us here are sinners. All of us here walk, walked away at one time because we were in love with the world. And all of us here who are saved have been redeemed and brought back. All of us. Here's the last thing. Your life can count for God. Maybe you, have, you don't know Jesus yet. Your life can count for God. Maybe you've walked away. Your life can count for God. Maybe you're somebody who's been faithful and you served in the kingdom for years. Your life makes a difference. Your life counts for God. I think what we read here at the end of 2 Timothy is one of the saddest, most impressive things in all of Scripture. Paul says, the time for my departure has come. What he's saying here is that I'm in jail. I've been sentenced to death. The day of my execution is approaching. Paul was this man that was the chief persecutor of the church. He was killing Christians. And then on the road to Damascus, he saw Jesus. Jesus called him to evangelize the world. And Paul's life was changed like a snap of a finger. And from that moment on, he began to walk with Jesus He wrote 13 letters to churches and people that formed the basis of our New Testament. He started tens of churches, saw tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people come into the kingdom of God. His work continued after his death so that the the, the church grew and expanded to now one out of every three people on the face of the earth believe in Jesus Christ as Savior. That was Paul. And this great man who was given this great task for God was now at the end of his life, and he said, the time for my departure has come. Are you listening? I have run the race. I have fought the fight. I have kept the faith. I did everything Jesus asked for me to do. I never gave up. I never gave up. And now I have for me the crown of righteousness. I'm right with God, and I'll be right with God forever. Now, I'm not, I'm not preaching this talking, okay? I'm just talking right now. I know a lot of people. When I go to Walmart, I don't shop. I have to work the crowd. You know what I'm talking about? That's how many people I know. I was, uh, and this is not, this might sound like ego. It's not. It, 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 I don't want to be well known. I really don't. I'm the shyest person that I know. I'm very shy. I don't want to be well known. But I was, uh, went to a, a, a concert with my family, a classical music concert. The great cellist Yo-Yo Ma was performing. So I got a chance to see Yo-Yo Ma. So I'm standing outside Christ's Hall in a line, and they're wanding us as we go in, because you've you got to watch out for those classical music people, you know? They're wanding us. So I'm standing in line there, and a lady, well-dressed lady, her husband walked by, and she says, she points at me, and she says, I watch him every Sunday on YouTube. I had to wait till I was in my 50s to be a social media influencer, you know? <laughs> and this is not a matter of ego. I walk by this picture frame in, the, in, the, in our foyer from time to time, and on that picture frame is almost every pastor. There's a few from the early years we don't have a picture of. Almost every pastor who served our church in, in, the, in the 155 years we've been a church. And these are good men. When I first became pastor 33 years ago, I knew some people who knew some of the pastors from the 20s and 30s. They were still alive. These are good men. Made a difference for the kingdom of God. But now they're all forgotten. Are you listening? They're all forgotten. The selection committee that that, uh, was leading the church when I and called me as pastor 33 years ago, everybody on the selection committee is dead. Except for one guy who's retired, and he's about 80 years old, lives in North Carolina. There's only a handful of people left from when I first became pastor. Virtually nobody in this service was here when I became pastor 33 years ago. A lot of folks have come and gone since then. 
Paul was expressing something really powerful here. He said, my life is being poured out like a drink offering. Now, a drink offering was an offering that was offered when the, when the blood for the sacrifice wasn't available. So they poured red wine over the altar, and then it flowed down and disappeared. It evaporated. Are you getting what Paul is saying? Here I am. I was called. I started churches. I wrote letters. I did all these things, and now my life just evaporates. One of the things that makes people afraid is of being forgotten. That's why we build these big tombs. That's why we put these marble tombstones down with our picture on it. The book will walk by and say, yeah, he lived, right? It doesn't make any difference. Fifty years from now, the only people who will remember me most likely will be my grandchildren. A hundred years from now, all of us on this earth are forgotten forgotten. If the Lord doesn't return, we're all forgotten. Does that bother you? It shouldn't. Because this is what Paul said. I've done all these things. My life's being poured out like a drink offering, and so my life's just going to evaporate away. But God knows what I accomplished. He knows how I served Him. He will give me the crown of being right with Him forever. And not only for me, but for all who long for His appearing. That is, all who love Jesus, all who love His kingdom, all who stayed with Him and didn't return to the, the old life and the present world. God knows what you've done. And, listen, listen, what you have done while you're alive for the kingdom of God will live on after you. We'll walk with that, that picture in the wall and see those men who were there. Or how about those people who were in the 20s and 30s uh, of the last century, they put up their homes so this church could be built? We are their legacy. And so one day, you'll turn to dust. Maybe people will forget you. But was it for nothing? You tell me. I, I hope to hear just a, maybe a breath. No. Because God knows. And you will leave behind your imprint. You can count for God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, right now we're thinking about Demas and how he left Paul to return to his former life because he just loved it too much. The sacrifice of taking care of Paul was too much. And today there are so many believers who walk away because the burden sometimes is just too great. They just run away from you. But you are the God who forgives, the God who restores, the God who brings people back. There are also a lot of marks who have walked away but have come back. And everyone who has returned, you have restored. And everyone you have restored, you are using for, for powerful things in your kingdom. Our lives can count for you. And even though we become dust, even though we're poured out like a drink offering, because we have won the race, because we have fought the fight, because we never gave up, you give for us a gift of being right with you forever and knowing that our lives made a difference in this world, even when we are forgotten. Now, right now, Father, the people here listening, watching, people who are watching online, people at the West Portsmouth campus who have not yet believed in Jesus, I pray right now will be that time. If you're that person, will you pray this prayer with me? Father, I know that I'm a sinner. I've broken your laws and commands. I pray you'll forgive me based on what Jesus Christ did for me on the cross. I pray you'll make me right with you so that I can live the life that you want me to live. I pray you live inside me by the power of the Spirit that I might know that I'm saved. And I pray this in Jesus' name. If you pray that prayer with me, you have now entered into God's family. Take the card you find in the chair, the form attached to the program. If you're watching online, you can talk to an online counselor and make your decision to believe in Jesus. Let us know so we can help you grow in your faith. Now, Father, we leave this place today. We pray we will, we will leave knowing that if we return, you accept us and you will use us and our lives can count for you. And we pray this in Jesus' name.
Amen. Hey everyone, thanks so much for watching. Be sure to drop us a like, subscribe, or follow us on social media so you don't miss any future content from DC Church.